Yeah. There we go. Okay, I appreciate that. Okay, welcome everybody to poster session number one. Uh, just give a brief introduction to how we're going to go through each of these. So we'll have seven posters that will be presented uh, in this session. They, we will go through them in the order that they're listed in the poster session. Um, each presenter will be live uh, presenting and walking through their posters. Once they start their presentation, they will have 10 minutes to uh, walk you through their poster. And we've asked each of the uh, poster presenters to save two to three minutes at the end uh, for individual questions for their poster. And that we also ask all of the poster presenters to stay till the end of the center um, session as well, once they've all been presented, so that if there's some group discussion and conversation, um, to uh, then everyone can participate. So, given that we are ready to go, Jill, are you ready to go? Um, hello. <laughs> actually, I was wondering. I just actually, um, I guess I uh, misunderstood. I had a colleague who's supposed to be presenting with me, and I. I'm just waiting to see that she's on the call. Is that okay? Um, sure. Can you uh, can you share your screen while we're waiting? Who are you looking for? Is there another person? Rachi Kana. So she's a member of my team. But I'll just um, share my screen anyhow, just to test that part. Uh, are you able to find the other person that's going to co-present? I can't see the full list. Richie, are you on the phone? Probably not. Okay, that's okay. Um, okay. Oh, I was hoping that she'd be here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so I can I can go ahead anyhow. Okay, um, go go ahead, Jill. I'm gonna let you just every post presenter just introduce themselves and the poster just so that you don't no one has to listen to me. Uh, and I'm starting the timer, so you have ten minutes, and uh, I look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Um, actually, one thing I didn't do is, oops, sorry, let me just one moment. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jill Hidalgo. I'm a dialysis RN at St. Paul's Hospital, and I'm really excited to have this opportunity to share our poster and our findings from our qualitative research study promoting self-management, addressing the educational needs of new HD patients or hemodialysis patients. So our project started out as an idea and a research question just over two years ago. And um, today I'm supposed to have my teammate, Prachi Kana, um, who is, um, I was hoping to present with me. Um, but anyhow, we're just, I'm just gonna jump right in. Um, so in our study, we basically, um, just scroll down here. In, my in our study, we basically wanted to explore how to facilitate self-management in patients with end-stage renal disease. So these patients face many physiological and emotional challenges as they go through um, their treatment plan and lifestyle changes as a new hemodialysis patient. Um, so pre-dialysis education pay, plays a key role in helping patients adjust to their kidney disease and adhere to treatment. When we surveyed the literature, we found that there's not much research showing patient involvement in the development of effective educational programs, which are generally designed by clinicians to address patients' needs. Our study had two objectives, uh, investigate the educational needs of patients from their point of view, obtain patient and nurse clinician perspectives on the facilitators and inhibitors of a structured educational program to promote self-management in new hemodialysis patients. Um, so how did we do the study? Um, the study was done at uh, Providence Healthcare at St. Paul's Hospital, the HD unit, which is Six Delta. Um, we use a qualitative research design using the interpretive description approach. Uh, for, for, the, for our procedures, we collected demographic data, we, uh, we conducted focus groups with our nurse clinicians and interviewed patients. Uh, a research patient, I mean, <laughs> patient patients in our unit. Uh, for a sample, uh, we, we had eight patient 
uh, participants who spoke English over 19 years of age and new to dialysis within the last six months. Um, we also conducted two focus groups with nurse clinicians, and we ended up having uh, nine registered nurses with varying levels of experience in dialysis that were of diverse age, gender, and cultural background. Um, we also interviewed two male nurse clinician uh, nurse leaders with over 10 years of working with managing staff and coordinating care for HD patients. Okay, so now I'll share our findings. So the, the patients we interviewed expressed several learning needs, including needing explanations about kidney disease, how the hemodialysis machine works, complications during and after HD, discussion of lab results and medications received during HD, as well as different treatment modalities. Recognizing the role in delivering patient education to new dialysis patients, nurses highlighted the importance of continuing education to address their own learning gaps and learn from other members of the renal team so that they could gain confidence in teaching patients and reinforcing what these patients may have previously learned. All participants noted that having a dedicated patient educator would facilitate effective delivery of patient education. In the absence of a patient, a dedicated patient educator, CNLs suggested uh, providing one-on-one -on -one education in the first three runs or treatments, assigning senior nurses to these new patients, and introducing um, them to another patient peer mentor who could support them when they're on the unit. So in conclusion, we found from our research, what we found was that uh, patient education is best delivered in a standardized format with con concise content tailored to the learning needs of the new HD patient. All participants noted that having a dedicated patient educator would be most effective in facilitating this education. Participants identified several barriers, including uh, lack of standardized uh, material, funding for a dedicated educator to help patients navigate the overwhelming amount of information received as a new dialysis patient, as well as competing nursing priorities and staffing issues. We hope that the themes we identified from our study will support new dialysis patients by helping the renal team recognize patient learning needs and helping them to self-manage by giving them information and explanations that they may need to know. So in the future, we hope that these findings can be used towards a follow-up research project, developing and piloting a patient education program here at St. Paul's. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge that this project was funded by the PhD Research Challenge Program and special thanks to our mentor, Professor Rick Sawatsky and our patient partner, Roselle Kalangan for her contributions. And this concludes our presentation and thank you again for your time. I'd like to open the floor now to any questions. Great. Thank you, Jill. Is there any, any questions from the floor? You can enter them in the chat, or if I've got, if you've got the meter on mute, just uh, feel free to answer your questions. So I'm seeing one comment. Uh, congratulations on the fabulous practice-based research uh, project. So I agree. Is there any questions? Further questions? I have a question. Um, when you say you, you have a patient partners, can you just elaborate a little bit for us what your patient partners did as part of this research team, just uh, in some of their experiences and your experiences working with patient partners? Mm -hmm. um, we actually only had one patient partner. Her name is Rizal Koyangan. Um, unfortunately, she couldn't be with us today. Um, she actually uh, was engaged from the beginning of the project. So when we initially um, uh, submitted our proposal, and so she was involved for um, like in in the initial stages of designing um, what our project was um, like, how we were going to design our project. And um, but unfortunately, due to health reasons, she she was unable to continue um, to support us uh, towards the end of the, or like even the, collecting the, the data and after that. So um, yeah, we engaged her from the beginning. She helped um, in the designing and as uh, unfortunately to health reasons, we had to not have her on our team for a good portion of the, the remaining of the study. Great, thank you. And do you have any 
you know, with the one facial partner, do you have any um, interest or ability to connect with um, new or additional patient partners to help you with the uh, dissemination of your funding? Um, definitely, um, it was a learning process working with our patient, that one patient partner. Um, as a uh, I guess kind of in the future, and we're hoping that with a, in a follow-up research project, we could either connect again with our patient partner and definitely engage more than one patient partner um, uh, for a, fo a follow-up project. Because um, we found that, um, at least in our, in our experience, that I think there was a burden or responsibility uh, placed on the patient partner to be to uh, that was too much for one patient partner. So definitely in the future, uh, I would, um, we would have more than one. Great, thank you. And I see a question in the uh, chat box here uh, from Davina. There is always the challenge of what is wanted versus what can be done within the health system. So how might you go about leveraging this work in your partnerships to advocate for new resources? I'm so sorry. Um, I can't see the question and uh, let me, I'm gonna stop. Screen sharing. Yeah. That'll work. <laughs> and okay, so sorry, I'm just, just as, gonna... a heads up, as a heads up, we have a minute and a half to move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is all the chance for what's wanted versus what can be done within the health system. Uh, I would say is wanted. I think that I think it'd be moving forward like if I were, we would definitely uh, what this what I found from my research is that we the importance of these partnerships and, and just in, engaging people at many levels. Um, there's so much how do we advocate for new resources? I'm so sorry. I guess I'm having difficulty with the question, um, but I, I see so much opportunity in and the work that we've done and engaging other people so that we can um, uh, use them to advocate for what is actually needed on the unit. Great, thank you, thank you. That was great, and uh, yeah, it's always always a challenge to uh, get going on uh, on Zoom and present over Zoom. So that was great. Um, and I think, you know, the takeaway from our perspective is, is, is your comment that being a patient partner can be quite burdensome. And uh, so we need to ensure that as researchers and as, you know, when we're engaging with patient partners, that we take that into consideration. And like you say, try to engage with as many patient partners as possible so they can share the load. Um, so yeah, okay, well, thank you, Jill. I'm gonna uh, move this over to the next uh, poster. And we're looking at quality of life assessments to support persons centered healthcare. And I believe, Rick, you're, the, you're going to be the presenter. So uh, please, if you could activate your video and your um, uh, mic, and uh, then you should be able to share your screen. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, calling in from a cell phone connection with limited bandwidth. Uh, an, an interior, um, so I don't I don't think the video is going to work, but I'm going to try to share my screen right now. See if that works. Sorry about that. Um, but thank you for the opportunity. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. We can see the, a few images. Yeah. Uh, okay. Great. That all, I'll, I'll scroll enlarge. Scroll up and down, that'll work great. Okay, I'll start yeah. the timer for you, Rick. So go ahead. Excellent. Thank you very much. So thanks very much for the opportunity. I'm just going to go into full screen here to share this work with you. Um, this work arose from uh, partnerships with healthcare providers and government and patients and family caregivers around what we're referring to as quality of life assessments or all other terminology she does use is the, is the use of patient reported outcomes and patient reported experience measures. And I've been um, doing this work for quite a few years. Um, and 
increasingly have come to realize that there's different knowledge gaps and different knowledge needs of different users, uh, whom we call knowledge users of this information. So briefly, quality of life assessments refer to the use of standardized tools to measure in a systematic way uh, um, areas that matter to the quality of life of patients and family caregivers. And this could include their symptoms, this could include aspects of their emotional, physical, or uh, mental well being. Um, and it could also include aspects of their healthcare experiences, such as whether they feel treated with respect and dignity, or whether they're involved in decision making in the way they want to be involved in decision making, and so on. And there's many different um, people that make use of this information. Um, Clinicians, of course, uh, healthcare uh, providers like physicians and nurses and other allied healthcare providers, uh, OT, and I won't go down the whole list, uh, have been using this kind of information to track how people are doing um, on an ongoing basis. For instance, in terms of their symptoms, we're all familiar with the pain question, for instance, uh, from zero to 10. Um, and But healthcare organizations have also been using this type of information for quality improvement purposes to make sure that the services address areas that really matter to patients and family caregivers and to be able to uh, target areas for improvements. Um, and then there's also uh, government uh, and and health more at the healthcare systems level uh, decision makers that use this information to track at the population health le level how is the population doing in terms of for instance their mental and physical health aspects of their mental and physical health but also their experiences with using health healthcare services um, and so we learned that. Um, uh, that these different knowledge users have different needs, different purposes for using these types of tools and different uh, needs for learning and be able to communicate around these types of tools. And that motivated the development of this project. And in this project, we focus specifically on quality of life assessments to support person-centered healthcare for older adults living with frailty and their family caregivers. And our purpose was to develop, to co-develop, knowledge translation resources to support the use of quality of life assessment tools with this population. And we did so by going through series of interviews and focus groups uh, with each of the four knowledge user audiences. And those audiences are uh, listed on the poster over here, uh, include, of course, the main audience, older adults and family caregivers, and we had 11 participants. Um, and then also we had the healthcare provider audience, uh, um, knowledge user audience with, with 13 participants, healthcare managers and leaders with 14 participants and government leaders and decision makers with uh, seven participants. And through that, we developed what we call co-developed what we call tailored resources for each of these, oops, each of these, oh, this is interesting. Uh, each of these knowledge user audiences. So we first interviewed them, learned about their knowledge use, then developed some, uh, so first interviewed them, learned about knowledge needs unique to each of these audiences, and then developed some uh, co-developed uh, with these audiences, some preliminary materials, and then went through formative evaluation cycles where we got iterative rounds of feedback on the resources we developed. And those resources are all available on our healthypol.com website. Um, and I'll just show that very briefly. They include uh, a couple of videos that were developed. Here you can see our website. It's all very much in plain language. We work, worked with a graphic artist. We worked with, with, with a, a communication uh, specialist to develop lay language terminology, basically communicate effectively, and we worked with a video artist. And um, we developed these resources then to communicate for these four audiences about the meaning of quality of life assessments. 
and how they can be used. So for patients and family caregivers, you can see we have two infographic brochures that people could click on and download. And we have also two different videos. One is a live action video with actual actors and the other is a whiteboard video. And similarly, we have resources for healthcare providers and resources for healthcare managers and leaders and for governments. And then I just want to draw your attention finally, and then I'll stop to these Rebecca, additional resources. Your screen share, your screen share we've lost, so. Oh, sorry. But you could see it on our, our website, uh, healthyql.com. And so the additional resources include references where we give citations for every claim made in each of the resources. So they are truly evidence-based. And we also have an environmental scan uh, the, related to each of the resources. I think I'll leave it there because I really welcome some opportunity for discussion and I apologize for the bandwidth issues. No apologies, Rick. I think uh, we're all getting a lesson in Zoom, Zoom 101. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's great. You know, it's a great platform, but it's, it's not perfect at, at all times. Yeah. And, uh, it also speaks to uh, some of the challenges that, uh, you know, when we're not living in the city with great uh, internet, uh, we uh, tend to be a bit spoiled. So I do appreciate uh, your efforts to connect and your share that you were able. And just a reminder to all participants that these posters are still on the website. And I suggest that maybe what you can do is um, view the sessions and click on the posters and you can view it on your own computer as well, just to reduce some of the stress on the presenters. So thank you. Um, so we do have two minutes and I'm wondering if anyone has a specific question for Rick. If there's no questions, I would really welcome you to go to that website and like our, our formative evaluation is ongoing. So I just welcome ongoing input and feedback on these resources. We're going to develop that site further, uh, focusing more on our methods cluster work on patient-centered measurement as well. Uh, methods and, and, and some other projects to do with quality of life assessments. So I know Rick, you would have trouble sharing uh, the link uh, through your phone on the website, but uh, we will definitely like the link is in the virtual poster in in the yes. view sessions. And oh, and thank you, Travis. He uh, he's put that in the uh, chat box as well. Oh, so, thanks so much. <laughs> Appreciate yeah, thanks. That. Thanks for helping out. This is a team teamwork uh, extraordinaire. Okay, so this was great. So thank you, thank you very much uh, for your uh, time. And I think what we can do now is move on to the next poster. So Lillian, I believe you're up next. And uh, so Rick, if you can uh, stop your screen share and your video. Well, you did great. Stop yes, share. thanks so much. <laughs> That's great. And you, and uh, so Lillian, uh, I'm going to get you to open up your video and your mic please and share your screen and while you're doing that i will just introduce briefly so lillian's our third presenter and uh, she will provide us with her input here are you able to see the my powerpoint yes we can see it thank okay. you all right, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the music headphones. So uh, this is a project that we did with um, um, patient partners. Um, Luca, who is a young person that who has uh, a family, his brother has um, a mental health illness, and he was very interested about how music could help his brother and the populations. And we also work with uh, Lily Wong. Lily is um, an older person that who uh, her mother had um, Alzheimer's disease. So she was also passionate about uh, any kind of non-pharmacological approach that could help um, people with dementia. And we also have another patient partner, Jim Mann, that who has been a, a really strong advocate and uh, doing a lot, a whole lot of stuff that uh, trying to. Um, uh, promote patient-oriented research and doing research with um, researchers as well. So, um, so maybe before I go into about how we uh, do the research, I will talk a little bit about um, the headphones. 
So the headphone is a little bit more than the regular music headphones that we use at home. Um, the sound is called headphone it has um, it's Lillian, are, you, are you advancing your slides? Because I think we've only seen the, the silent disco headphones. Is that all you wanted to see? Yeah, I haven't advanced it. Uh, oh, okay. um, all right. okay. That's fine. I just wasn't sure. Okay. Maybe I'll move the next one and I'll keep talking about the headphones. <laughs> uh, yes, and um, why we use this particular headphone? The headphones has uh, the noise cancellation um, feature. So it will help really help the population of people with dementia to um, reduce the distraction from the environment. And also you can imagine that um, with the aging years, you know, having a high quality music that uh, have a better quality that will help to, to reduce the sensory load. So the person will be able to focus and enjoy the, you know, the music a lot better. So it, it really helps the, the special needs of the populations. And um, another thing that um, the, um, these headphones, it comes with a, um, a facilitator mic, they call a DJ mic. So uh, the therapist, because when the therapist use that mic, and then if there's a group of people wearing these headphones in different areas, they could be in the room, they could be in um, in a common areas. So they could all hear the, um, the therapist. And often with the first time when we put it in the, in the um, patient's ears, they often we say, oh, wow, we could hear. So it does make a difference in, in terms of having um, that uh, quality of the audios. So this is Luca, you can see him that, um, so the way that um, we have patient and family uh, partner, they were Lillian, able- Lillian, I don't think your slides are advancing. Oh, I see it on my, do you, you don't see Luca and- No, we just, I think we're just dancing your first screen. Oh, it shows on my screen that I have, um, okay, let me stop sharing and then try to share again. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Okay. If I share, I'll go to here, share. You now see patient-oriented research or underpinning slide. Okay, so let me see. I don't know I could advance this slide. I'm not my okay, let's see. So the way that we work together is uh, we um, we we're guided by these principles, um, inclusiveness. Uh, you can see that we have a younger person, we also have an older person, we try to include people in different um, diversity groups. And offer, when we do things together, we offer support and then there's really mutual expect respect about people's experiential knowledge. And we try to co-build the knowledge through the research. And I hope you see this slides. Is it moving, my slides? Do you see a new slide? Yes, sorry, <laughs> I was muted. You see a, a, a PDF of involving patients and families in the social robots. Right. Yes. Yeah, so we have a team of um, patient and uh, family partners that we um, kind of, we have relationships, so we, we do put projects from project to projects. So it makes it easier when we have that relationship already built. And of course we welcome new members, but having a core team that people that already know each other and uh, it makes it easier for women, especially when we apply for grants and um, to do the work together. So um, the, these are the two questions that we ask. What are the patient's experience of participating in the program and what are the staff perspective? So we want to engage um, uh, patient and family partners. So we want to understand, you know, the specific needs on the population, but we also want to understand the staff perspective in order to um, implement a technology into the clinical setting. So we wanted to use this uh, particular headphone in, uh, in the hospital. So um, you can see this is an image of Ben that he was enjoying the, the music when he is in incumbent areas. That was, this is pre-COVID, so you can see they were not physical distance, but um, the guy sitting next to him, you might see a little bit of yellow. He was actually um, um, swearing. He was not in a very good mood, but that didn't bother Ben at all. Ben was having a good time. And um, 
other images about, um, you can see Mary here, that Mary was actually having a lot of pain that day. And uh, when she was invited to um, use a headphone uh, to do a, a music program that she actually got up and um, she danced with uh, our recreation um, staff and um, she was she was amazed herself as well and we were all amazed to see that you know the smile in her face because she was having quite a bit of pain and um, it was it was just wonderful to see that something actually helped her and um, she, that she had a bit of relief um, during that time and um, this is another person that it's interesting when we do this research with um, uh, uh, older populations that who have um, um, some people have a, a latest in the later stage of the dementia, and because they had a, they were in a, they had the disease for quite a while, and they've been taking some medications and you know, the changes uh, that uh, that associated with the disease, and they their, um, how they respond on um, to um, intervention that it's sometimes it's not so obvious. So when we were looking at these uh, video, we use uh, video techniques and we will go um, see how people use the headphone, we'll film that and then we'll bring the film um, to the team and then we'll do team analysis. So we have like physicians, nurses and occupational therapists and patient and family partners. We look at the film together to see um, how people respond and how people use the technology. And um, there's a lot of advantage of doing it this way because it will allow us, you know, to um, to slow down the, the footage and watch it like over and over again. And um, I find that this works really well with our patient and family partners as well. And looking at our video, um, sometimes the, our um, patient partner will tell us, you know, did you notice something, you know, that often, you know, there's something that we might, like myself might not notice, things that could be very subtle and having different lens people bring from the background. It really helps. In this particular case, that we were not sure that he actually liked the, the music or not, because he was actually, um, I don't know, maybe you can play it. So you can see that his face, he looks kind of angry. And he was like tapping that chair. So I wasn't sure that he really liked the music or not. But then, then when we sit together and then how we um, had a conversation. We see how the his, his um, the rhythm of the uh, hitting that chair goes along with the music. That you know, and then we did an interview with him, and that was that confirmed that you know that did make a difference, and he really enjoyed the um, the, the program. So this is a, another person that she um, uh, yeah she was um, she really really enjoyed the program because it helped her to uh, express herself. And now uh, she said that, that the quote uh, that she said that the headphone helped me to get into the mood right away. Uh, I love dancing and like singing. So we wanted really to understand that like, what are the difference with the headphones or without the headphones in terms of people doing music programs. We have one minute left. Okay, so I'm not gonna go further with any of the others. So I'm just gonna leave it with the, um, with the posters. And um, yeah, so, I welcome questions and uh, there's a little QR code and um, if anyone who have an interest in them um, uh, to watch these videos and they are, will be available if you go uh, use your phone to scan that QR code. Great, thank you, thank you. Very interesting, it'll be uh, um, interesting to hear some of the findings as well from your study as, as they come forward. I really like the idea of the noise canceling headphones as well. I think. Mm -hmm. It helps people filter and, and listen and, and, and focus. So thank you very much. Okay, so if you can stop sharing your sh your screen, Jillian, I'm going to ask uh, Alana if she's up next with our with our oops, there's my timer um, for the next poster. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so I'll just pull up my poster here. How's the volume? Can everyone hear me? I can hear you, but I don't have noise canceling headphones and so. <laughs> okay. Uh, so hello everyone. My name is Lana Koopmans. I'm presenting from Prince George, which is situated on the traditional territory of the Clately Tene. Uh, I'm a fourth year honors student in the health sciences program at UNBC. Um, today I'll be presenting my poster on my experience 
with the pop new project um, as an undergraduate student working as the patient engagement coordinator. So uh, a bit of background, uh, POTMU stands for Patient Oriented Predictive Modeling of Healthcare Utilization. It's a joint site project between UNBC and uh, Thompson Rivers University. Our patient partners are from the interior of BC and Northern BC. And we currently have five patient partners on our team. Our project uses a patient-oriented approach to advanced data science methods uh, to predict health system utilization. In patient-oriented research, patients are considered equal members of a research team. And the experience of our project has shown that adopting this perspective of equal membership in regard to undergraduate students can be valuable for a research team. Why, would, why is involving undergraduate students important? A key thing, uh, first of all, is mentoring of undergraduate students in patient-oriented research is an investment in the future of patient-oriented research. For many students, it may be the first opportunity to engage in a research opportunity. It provides undergraduate students hands-on experiential learning that they may not otherwise experience through regular coursework and it can further equip them to pursue patient-oriented research in the future. So it is my hope by the end of this presentation that whether you're a student or a supervisor of students or a patient partner, you may consider involving undergraduate students as active and equal members of your research team. Uh, or you may learn from some of the ways in which our team involved an undergraduate student and you may just find that um, involving undergraduate students can be valuable. So some methods. Um, as patient engagement coordinator, I was given the freedom and flexibility to develop this role. Our team created a rhythm and predictable schedule as seen in the figure in the left-hand corner um, where discussion questions were sent out each month by email patient partners would send their responses back to myself and I would summarize these together and put them into a PowerPoint for our team to discuss in our monthly meetings. After monthly meetings, we'd send out the PowerPoint presentation and the notes taken during the meeting and put them into our team wiki page. I was also available throughout the month via Zoom, telephone, or email correspondence to um, answer any questions or problems or ideas that patient partners may come across throughout the month. These methods of engagement led to in, an environment of um, co-investment in relationships and mutual respect. So in regards to co-investment, um, effort was put in by all members of the team to develop relationships. Uh, sharing of thoughts and opinions wasn't one-sided, but it was coming from everyone on the team, including research researchers, uh, students, and patient partners. And then in terms of mutual respect, uh, each member of the team was regard regarded as valuable. Uh, it was realized that each person has their own views and opinions. And there was space made for everyone to provide their views and opinions. So in the middle table, we can see a few of these examples and the co-investment and mutual respect was um, evident or displayed through knowledge and expertise, organization and consistency and time. Uh, so knowledge and expertise, we realize that each member of the team brings their own experience and students have knowledge and expertise too. So in the new uh, project specifically, uh, it was shown that um, in terms of technology, uh, the student was able to provide a fair bit of support and knowledge in that way. Uh, organization and consistency recognize that um, respecting one another's preferences for formatting documents, or uh, that's one example, um, just 
respecting each other and making the methods to do so. And then in terms of time, it connected to both themes. Um, each person was putting time into the project and by being present and listening to others whenever we were meeting, this created respect and built relationships. So I'll move into discussion. Developing a team and methods where each member is valued and respected is crucial. And involving undergraduate students and involving them as equal partners led to this in our, in our team. So a quote that was said by one of our patient partners in the right hand corner, we see, I'm so grateful with this project. You have ensured we have your student assistant being there for us whenever we require her support. This assistant has truly decreased barriers and allowed us to feel comfortable as contributors respected and feel like team partners. So the experiences of the PopMe team is unique and cannot be replicated exactly by others, by other teams, but by sharing what we as a team have done and how our team has benefited from involving an undergraduate student. We hope this poster and information may be beneficial for those of you looking to involve students in your project. And I'll just give two uh, uh, ideas to engage students and a bit of an exercise for you to do later on, but uh, two ways you could do so is, or important ways to do so is, uh, first of all, get to know them. Uh, this leads to having a greater understanding of how and where they fit into your research team. And then secondly, don't underestimate their ability or capacity to try new things, because you'll find that students are often up for anything. Um, so the dissemination or KT approach, uh, report as this topic will be added to our team wiki page, and that's accessible at popmu.ca is right here, or if you have a, a smartphone available, you could try to take a photo and it should bring you straight to the site. Um, I'd like to acknowledge and thank um, my supervisors, Dr. Shannon Freeman and Dr. Piper Jackson, and thank them for their ongoing support uh, in this role. And then I'd also like to acknowledge our patient partners, um, Brent Baker, Carl Zanin, David Watts, Grace Kramer, and Sue Pryor. And then many thanks to the Patient Voices Network and BC Support Unit. Uh, my contact email is down below and that is where I'll end for today. Thank you. Great, thank you, Alana. Lovely presentation. Um, <laughs> I, I like your comment, uh, don't underestimate the undergrad students. They're <laughs> pretty well up for anything. Um, you know that's that's great and i think you know, you know it is it is a lot about using uh, different people of different ages and different skill sets on your team that everyone brings unique experiences and skills and it's about understanding like you say getting to know each other working developing a working relationship and building on what the skill sets and experiences that are coming in so um thank you and lovely is there any other questions for uh, yeah, no, that's great. And, uh, you know, so just the comment to see that, uh, see patient oriented research and then undergraduate work uh, engagement, and also the acknowledgement that your role in being the point of contact and the support for your patient partners and how valuable that is on a team to have someone who's designated and gets to know the patient partners. And, they can develop that relationship and trust with that person is, 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 is invaluable. So thank you very much. Okay, thank All you. Right, I'm going to ask you to unshare if that's possible, please. And the next person that's going to be coming up is Aaron Donald. I think I've seen you. Okay, it will be Daniel and Kara for Aaron. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, as long as you're all up and running. <laughs> That would be great. So um, I'm going to get you to share your screen, please, Carol. Okay, one sec here.
It'll just take a sec. Yeah, no problem. I won't start the timer until until you're ready to go. So <laughs> we've got time at the end and some leeway. So okay. Um, yeah, we weren't quite sure what to expect here, so we kind of tried to prepare for lots of different scenarios. But anyway, I think Daniel will start us off. Daniel? Maybe have I got what Daniel is Daniel? There we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Daniel Sands, and this is Kara Whitlock. Uh, we are two members of the Lived Experience Advisory Committee, uh, collaborating on a research project funded by the BC Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research. Um, did you want to do a land acknowledgement? Did you? Sure. Um, yeah, I just want to um, acknowledge um, Canada's um, um, colonial past and ongoing colonial present that creates negative health outcomes. Yeah, I appreciate grounding the work we're doing today in, in that. Um, this project and this work builds on the program of research on equity informed palliative care, EPAC, led by Dr. Kelly Stajahar out of the University of Victoria. Um, we'll discuss a bit of the background information that informs our work together to understand the importance of including a lived exp experience advisory committee in equity informed patient oriented research. We will then discuss our methods, initial findings, our approach to knowledge translation and our recommendations. Uh, this poster gives a more complete overview if you'd like to know more. So let's go over some of the background terms and concepts we will use today. Okay, first up we have um, structural disadvantage, um, which we use uh, as people who face structural vulnerabilities, for example, homelessness, poverty, criminalization, racism, stigma, and who also have chronic illnesses such as lung, liver, or kidney disease face severe disadvantages as their health declines. Uh, next one is inequity. These systematic and social inequities can lead to multiple unmet health needs, lack of trust in the healthcare system or its providers, and feeling judged when seeking health, when seeking care for issues such as mental health or substance use. Lack of representation. Research that our team has done suggests that the perspectives of people who face such inequities are seldom considered, especially when they interact with healthcare providers. Proms and prems. Uh, patient, record, patient reported outcome measures and patient reported experience measures are, um, offer a potential avenue for making the needs and concerns of structurally vulnerable persons visible within the healthcare system. Although we know how PROMS and PREMS can help other populations, we don't have much information about how this could be accomplished for those of us marginalized by the healthcare system. Okay, methods. <laughs> the aim of this study is to advance methods in the implementation of PROMS and PREMS with people experiencing homelessness, substance use, or mental distress who also experience chronic illness. We hope to identify and explain in the context of lived experience what is most important to measure and the best way to measure it. Our lived experience advisory committee met virtually with two research team members eight times from uh, May to August 2020. Our small group size and the longer two hour meeting times provided an opportunity for a close team relationship to form. Relationship building was foundational to our process and we worked to create a respectful and more equitable research space. Um, we took the time to get to know each other and we didn't even start talking about proms and prems until around the fifth meeting. In this sense, relationship building can be seen as necessary for meaningful collaboration as it takes time to make research participation um, accessible to the community. Advisory committee members elaborated on the meaning of key PROM and PREM concepts, including quality of life and quality of care. Though through exploring our lived context, we identified what is important and why it may be important to measure. 
So we're moving so fast here on the, on the, on the slide, read real fast. <laughs> um, themes in our initial findings. Okay, let me just catch up. This is all on the, you can see this on the website too, if you wanted to read it more in depth. Because there's no rush, you have five minutes. Okay. Um, experience measures were identified as a top priority by our research committee members, as were relational prom and prem measures, including um, themes of trust and relationship building, quality of life, and equity. We identified that the ideal tools would measure both experience and outcome to reflect the importance of trust and relationship building. The relational piece is something we think is often missed when working with people experiencing structural vulnerability. As a healthcare provider, you should not assume you automatically inspire trust. Often, it can be quite the opposite. When we were thinking about why this matters for PROMs and PREMs, we believe it suggests that how this tool is administered is equally, if not more important, as what tool is chosen. Therefore, relational trust is the most important factor in capturing high quality data. One of the ideas we heard repeatedly in our advisory is that not sharing information with your provider is a strategy for continued access to care. Honest Honest disclosure can result in penalties like being discharged from care, being stigmatized, or losing the right to self-determination and shared decision-making. Proms and prams sometimes assume that the problem is that people don't know what information to share with their pro provider, but we are very aware of the power imbalances in healthcare and therefore what we share is usually deliberate. Often, we know nothing about the provider, yet they have access to all of our information before meeting us. The requests for our honest feedback can be a risk to us, especially without having demonstrated, having a demonstrated trusting relationship in place. Um, knowledge translation. This isn't quite lining up with our poster, but I'm just letting you kind of take a look at it while we're going through what we thought might be most relevant for this presentation. Okay, so knowledge translation. Um, our advisory entered this work by first talking about our care ex experiences to inform our understanding of PROM and PREM definitions. Concepts such as quality of life, trust, relationship, safety, and care were explored to pull out our identified meanings before we looked at the measurement definitions. This is an important distinction because when we think of healthcare as a relational practice, we need to understand that people experiencing structural vulnerability often have a different relationship with the healthcare systems. Concepts may mean different things to people depending on how they experience this relationship. Using our understanding of knowledge translation as an act of mutual information sharing, our advisory translated our lived experiences of discrimination and stigmatization in the healthcare system to help identify some of the assumptions embedded in existing um, measurement tools. This experiential basis provides the necessary context to measure what matters through a more meaningful and inclusive patient-oriented co-development process. Um, did we want, did, where are we at now? Yeah. Did we want to take some questions? We have recommendations, but we're just pretty much reading them off the, the poster, so. <laughs> you have a minute and a half, and uh, if there's any questions, there is one question is, yeah. what does it mean to be equity informed and can you def define it in the context of your project? I think equity informed is realizing that not everyone has the same access to service and not everyone has the same um, relationship with service. And so understanding that it means you don't assume um, it's, we all have the same universal experience. You know. There's a question from the rural urban divide question mark from John. Does John, would you like to explain what you're a little more what you're wanting to know there? I think you can un unmute yourself, John. Yeah, I, I'm, I've, I've done that. Um, yeah, I'm concerned about uh, the availability of, for instance, uh, palliative care and extended care in a community such as Valemount 
where we have to send our pioneers uh, away um, and, and isolating them uh, and isolating ourselves. Uh, I hope that's a relevant question. Um, from what I know, and I'm by no means any kind of expert in, in this context, but I've heard that rural areas have a very different experience of palliative service access. And I think that that, and, and also too, what kind of palliative service ac services would be um, important may be different too. So, but for, for Daniel and I in this, in this, what we, our role in this project were, was to speak to the lived experience, like for having, being people who have had experiences with um, homelessness and chronic illness, uh, it felt important to include our, our perspective when developing even what the measures meant or what measures to use or what we're actually measuring. So we've been sort of working Wait. alongside each other for a couple of months now, hey? And I, th I think one of the biggest um, um, benefits and, and, and side effects of this for me personally was just this empowerment that, you know, my, my experiences, my challenges, you know, they, they, are, they are of value and, you know, people want to hear about it. And, and being, being a part of this advisory committee just really was empowering and, and I felt listened to, I felt heard, I felt seen. Yeah, and it was, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it was really, yeah, really quite amazing. So uh, I, I do hate to cut off this dynamic presentation and excellent presentation from the two of you. Thank you for uh, going with the uh, flow and uh, being prepared for anything and doing a fantastic job. Uh, you're a great tag team. Um, again, the PDF and the resource will be a fantastic tool and you really do speak to the incredible value uh, that uh, partnering uh, as, a, as a person with lived experience, the richness it brings not only to the work, but also to the uh, dissemination and sharing of the information as well. So thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to just ask you, if, thank you again, if you can um, turn off your videos. And we, again, I'm just trying to keep us on time. Uh, there will be time for conversation at the end of this. So please uh, keep that in mind, uh, we can have the further conversation. So the next presenter will be Davina, I think, uh, presenting a scoping review on behalf of her team, and I'll let her take it away. Okay. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Hi, everybody. Um, what a hard presentation to follow. That was amazing. Um, and I've seen so many great presentations, so it, it's uh, really awesome to be here. Um, I've just noticed my screen has gone blank. Can, are you able to see the poster um, for the we audience? We see the end of slideshow, so I think you just uh, hit exit or something. There you oh, go. You're back, you're back up and running. There we go. Okay, so uh, hi, my name's Davina Banner. I'm based at UMBC in beautiful Prince George, um, which is located here on the traditional ancestral territories um, of the Lake League today, um, where I'm very uh, pleased to uh, be able to live and work, um, and also pleased to be able to present today on behalf of our team. Um, and so our, our trainees, Jennifer and Hayden, um, this uh, presentation will speak to their literature review and I'm presenting on their behalf. But our wider team, I'd also like to recognize uh, Mark Baines, who is our patient co-lead, um, who is the Vice President of HeartLife um, and has worked with us for, for some time. And so as many of you are aware, uh, patient-oriented research has really become a new frontier in, in health research globally, uh, and particularly here in Canada. And we've seen a real rapid growth in um, patient-oriented research activities across all of the healthcare um, domains. And while, um, while this growth has been amazing, it's also really revealed some areas of, of, of challenge and some areas that really need to be fixed. And so um, our work started uh, really related to a presentation that happened during the CADIS conference. Um, and it was recognized that um, patient groups were not included in conversations around uh, evidence-based practice but also that there were some contentious issues around compensation and conflict of interest. And so 
um, our, our work has re really evolved around that to explore more specifically how compensation and conflict of interest is managed and understood in the context of patient-oriented research. And really our goal is to bring about a conversation of how, um, how we explore compensation, conflict of interest, but include um, th those activities with our patient partners, our community partners, who may not be as familiar with those kinds of terminology um, and processes. And so uh, we were funded by the Michael Smith Foundation um, and our team is a, a diverse group of stakeholders and the research itself will involve a literature review um, and here we're just going to present our foundational findings around what compensation and conflict of interest means in the context of patient-oriented research and we'll be following this with a tweet chat um, towards early November and then um, a consensus building event. And so um, compensation is an expectation within the context of patient oriented research, but we know from experience that um, that can be a bumpy ride. We know that many patient partners may not receive adequate compensation or may not receive compensation that's appropriate to their needs um, or preferences. And we also know that often the financial elements of any research projects can be quite a mystery and they can be quite a mystery to many team members, but for patient partners as, as newer members of collaborative teams, this may yield really a, a new kind of language and a new area of, uh, um, of the study that perhaps they've not necessarily had experience of before. And so we hope to demystify the process, but open a conversation around conflict of, of interest and down the line to develop tools to support patient partners and team members to engage in um, open, transparent conversations around compensation arrangements, but also to allow um, and to encourage patient partners and others to ask very real questions about conflicts of interest. And so we started with a literature review and we did the scoping review. We've screened eight databases and over 20,000 um, sources and we got down to a total of 61 articles and within that we had um, just shy of 20 articles that focus specifically around um, patient related um, conflicts of interest and so forth and then the rest were more on the traditional professional side so healthcare providers and researchers and so forth. So the literature review we did in two tiers and then combined at the end um, and this allowed, allowed us to look specifically around those patient needs, but also to look um, how, and, and cross tabulate these with um, more traditional uh, literature focused on healthcare providers and researchers. And so what we found was that there were really varied definitions of what conflicts of interest meant. And there was a lack of consistency about what constitutes a conflict of interest. However, typically we saw um, common areas like financial incentives and personal gains, but also things like socio-political uh, influence as, as some of those um, kind of aspects of conflict of interest. And we also saw a real lack of consistency in the literature about how conflicts of interest and compensation were talked about. And so we had quite a lot of, of literature that had identified um, that the financial elements of research practice are often poorly described, poorly reported and poorly understood. And we also found that there was a lack of consistent policies um, and guidelines. And that was particularly um, with respect to patient or patient groups. And we included patient advocacy organizations as part of that. And um, a larger component of the literature uh, that was focused on some of the challenges around um, commercial funding. So that's funding around uh, funding that has come from an industry partner and some of the challenges around that. And more specifically, uh, one of our final findings was that in the context of patient oriented research, there's really not a lot of literature that has talked about compensation and conflict of interest and how to um, best address this. And so uh, as a starting point, we, we will use these findings to inform a tweet chat where we hope to gain some um, 
insights and input uh, from diverse uh, stakeholders um, and the public around uh, compensation and conflict of interest. But our long-term goal is really to develop some guidelines that can help us address this and specifically some patient oriented research tool, tools that teams can use um, both to empower and support patient partners to ask about compensation and conflict of interest, but also teams to do that together. Um, our final step will be um, a virtual consensus building workshop where we hope to um, develop some priorities um, some shared actions for moving forward and possibly some uh, new research. So I kept it nice and short, but um, I would love to hear if there are any questions. So I'm not seeing anything in the chat box. We do have a, we do have a couple minutes. What kind of tools do you think need to be developed? What format? Is it a think, PDF going to help or what, yeah, what other forms of dissemination and sharing? I think that's a great question and that's one of the, the things that we want to ask about in our tweet chat is really to get a sense of what, um, what, what people uh, would like to see. I think it would be helpful um, to have a tool, whether that's a kind of a checklist or a guide of questions um, that people can use to ask team members about the funding of research projects, um, you know, what the implications of the, that funding is, um, and also uh, to support team members um, in their own um, practice of talking about conflicts of interest and talking about compensation. And so um, really not singling um, patient partners out, but but also wanting to provide tools that I think would really empower people to step forward and, and ask some of those questions because I think um, it can always be challenging. I think to talk about financial mm. issues. Um, so I, um, we're hoping to get a lot of um, input on what that would look like. I think it might also be helpful to have some videos. Um, and some other uh, resources that might kind of explain some of the, the um, language, the expectations around, you know, what does a conflict of interest, you know, what, how do we define it? What does it mean? What might it look like? Uh, this is Carl. I have something for Davina if it's time. Yeah, of course. Uh, I can't, okay. Recently I was in, uh, in the situation of looking into restive care. And um, it appears that that is a transient situation that may continue for some time. And um, the part that I understood is that the caregivers cannot enter um, and, and give rest and uh, relaxation to the people looking after those that are uh, invalid and at home. And there are no openings at this time, and there's no relief for the person providing the uh, care. And um, I just want to identify that situation. I'm not sure just how it fits in, but uh, there, there is conflict and compensation, uh, regardless of the compensation, it means there's a, a need for a different approach possibly. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I think, um... Conflicts are always challenging, you know, any conflicts of interest or conflicts are always challenging in any relationship and um, and it can be hard to have the conversations and I think empowering people to to ask about compensation and conflicts is, is really important. So that's, um, I appreciate that's a very difficult situation. Thank you, uh, Davina. I'm, again, I'm gonna wrap up. There are some uh, questions in the chat box and just a reminder that all, all questions that are open to everyone, um, we will keep these, we save these chat boxes and we will certainly uh, put together these um, specific questions and they're always great. And always the area of compensation and conflict of interest always generates the most conversation. So a reminder that this opportunity that after this next and 
last and definitely not least uh, final poster that uh, we are going to be asking all the presenters to please stay in the room for any additional questions as well. So I think Peg, you've been waiting patiently. Um, so I'm going to ask Davina for you, you can shut off your video, please. And uh, we'll let uh, Craig uh, step up and, and present our last poster. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh... Let this kind of pull up my PowerPoint here. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for your your patience, and thanks also for everybody's uh, wonderful posters. It's very uh, informative and good to see all of the wonderful work that people are doing. Uh, so I'm here to uh, present on. Wabish uh, Gibijigosganj, White Horse, a learning pathway to foster better Indigenous cultural competence in Canadian healthcare and research. Um, so I'll just introduce myself. I'm Craig Seti. I'm the coordinator of uh, the Indigenous Peoples Engagement and Research Council. That is a part of the CanSolve CKD network. It's a it's a national uh, kidney research network. Uh, it's one of the five. Uh, spore on its disease networks. Uh, I originally come from Winnipeg, uh, and my family comes from communities around uh, Lake Winnipeg in Manitoba. So here's uh, the e-poster that uh, was submitted from uh, from our team. Um, I'll just give a brief uh, synopsis on the the sidebar there. Um, so these are are kind of our four guiding. Uh, principles that we uh, like to share about the pathway. So we encourage looking, listening, learning, and leading. And so the, the aim of that is to uh, looking uh, for researchers to observe and examine racial identities and biases, listening to Indigenous voices and stories by, by participating in learning, uh, learning markers, learning by enhancing knowledge of history of colonization in Canada and its impacts on Indigenous peoples, communities, and nations, and leading by reflecting on learnings and taking appropriate actions in building respectful partnerships. Um, so from there, I'll, uh, I'll move into the next part of the presentation and uh, just kind of walk us through the learning pathway. And just wanted to note as well in the uh, in the bottom of the bar there, there's also the QR codes on each of the slides if people wanted uh, more information on the learning pathway that's available on there as well. Um, so just to give a little bit of background that can solve CKD, it's a national network that brings together kidney patients, researchers, healthcare providers, policymakers, and caregivers. And part of CanSolve, as I mentioned, is the Indigenous Peoples Engagement and Research Council. So there's they're one of two um, patient councils that are part of CANSOL. Um, however, this one is an Indigenous focused one. So there are 25 plus members. There are Indigenous patients, there are caregivers, there are researchers and community leaders who are uh, all a part of the Indigenous uh, Peoples Engagement Research Council. We also call it IPERC. And so this photo is actually from uh, the last time that we were able to gather in person at our CANSOL annual meeting in uh, 2019. IPERC also supports collaboration grounded in traditional values and partnerships with Indigenous communities. Uh, and so I'll just share a quick uh, piece about this photo. This is um, Helen Robinson Sati and Arlene Dejarlis. And so they're uh, taking a picture with a horse uh, that was part of a ceremony that we attended to honor the, uh, the name of the learning pathway. And I'll share a little bit more about that later. So having kidney research through an Indigenous lens is an important part of IPERC's mandate and vision as well. And part of that uh, vision is educating researchers and healthcare providers to work collaboratively and respectfully with Indigenous peoples. And this photo here is also um, another experience that we've had with uh, the Learning Pathway Working Group. Um, this was a naming ceremony. Um, so initially, Wabish um, Gebiji was, uh, it, it is one of five learning branches that's part of the training and mentorship committee for the council and, and so found that making sure there's an identity for 
uh, this learning pathway to increase uh, indigenous cultural competency and cultural safety was uh, an important part of um, our co-developing and co-building with um, our, our working group. So here I'll get to a little bit more about Wabish Gbjuskan's learning pathway. So it is a learning pathway designed to enable research team members to build culturally safe, respectful partnerships with Indigenous peoples and communities in health research. And so I'll just talk a little bit more about also the building of the identity of Wabish Gbjuskan. So you can see we have a, uh, a breakdown of how to pronounce the word, um, the name, Wabishke Bijigoskanj, so that's um, in Anishinaabe Moon. Um, and so in the previous picture, there was uh, Dan Thomas, no, no, Keeper Dan Thomas was in there, and he's the one who we held the pipe ceremony with, and uh, that name was shifted to the learning pathway um, and its work. Um, and so part of Part of what Dan shared with us about the name, Wabish Gibiji Gostanj, as you'll see in the logo there too, there's kind of one hoof of the horse that is kind of more prominent in the bottom front part of the picture. And he said there was a teaching that came from him that was a horse that he saw in this pipe ceremony vision was that there, that horse was pawing at the ground and it was pawing at a root. And what he shared with us is that that root is racism, and that is also a part of the aim of the learning pathway is to help to um, dig up that root and to help distill racism. So with that name, there were also colors that were given. Um, so white, blue, red, yellow, you'll see in uh, the logo here. And this logo is also developed by um, one of our working group members, uh, uh, family members, who's a graphic designer. So um, she was able to help um, share this this image and bring it out from the conversations that we've had with with her to help us uh, bring this identity more to the forefront for the learning pathway. And for the learning pathway itself, um, I have this graphic, but I'll go into each um, of the learning markers that are part of there. So I think it's important to start with curiosity and openness to listen and learn. Um, and so you'll see that there's a number of stops. There's Kairos blanket exercise, there's Sanyas Indigenous Cultural Safety Training. There are a series of webinars on Indigenous research ethics and protocols. There is one component that is um, just being finalized um, in the next uh, few months here, and that's a knowledge keepers and research component. It's a virtual booklet that will be uh, a part of this pathway. And then there are below that on the next stop is uh, uh, OCAP training. So OCAP is Ownership, Control, Access, and Possession. And that uh, talks more about um, data sovereignty and collection of data with uh, First Nations and also the Tri-Council Policy Statement with uh, focus on Chapter 9. And the last stop is also just uh, a recommendation that we are working on, which is a book club, uh, because we know that the learning doesn't stop with, uh, with, with uh, training markers and learning markers, but that the uh, cultural empathy uh, and uh, cultural humility um, continues in our, in our lifelong learnings. So I'll move into a little bit more detail on specific stops. Um, so the Kairos blanket exercise, it's a participatory exercise that builds awareness of historic relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in Canada. Um, we also have uh, links to websites at the bottom of uh, each of these stops just for more information. Um, so this picture was also at uh, one of our previous CANSOLV uh, annual meetings where we held a uh, blanket exercise for the network members there as part of the meeting. So Sanya's Indigenous Cultural Safety online facilitated training program designed to increase knowledge, enhance self-awareness and strengthen the skills of those who work both directly and indirectly with Indigenous people. And I think it's also, um, somewhat of a mandatory training for some of the health uh, care sectors in, in British Columbia, as well as in uh, a couple of other provinces. So the fundamentals of OCAP, the online training program, provides a compre comprehensive overview of the history of OCAP and its applications in research and information governance. And that's also um, has been developed by the First Nations 
to this government. Oh, sorry. Can't remember the acronym there, but uh, there's more information there at the bottom. And the series of webinars um, that we co developed with um, Dr. Malcolm King. Um, here are the three webinars just to bullet point information to understand Indigenous worldviews. Second, to learn about Indigenous research ethical, ethical principles and protocols. And the last one is to acquire skills for respectful engagement in Indigenous research. And for the knowledge keepers and research component, uh, I'll just share a little bit more as we're developing it. So we've um, done individual interviews with uh, each of the knowledge keepers. Um, from there, we kind of developed um, our, a story, uh, our themes from there. Um, and we've been working with those knowledge keepers since then. Um, and in the past, in last October, we had a gathering with them to um, bring them together and also for them to introduce, be introduced to each other because it's um, sometimes difficult to meet with them individually and bring all that information together. So it was important to build that relationships with uh, amongst the group. Um, so the information and teachings from from uh, those times together will be converted into a virtual booklet um, and they can be used by researchers patients and others to understand the importance of traditional knowledge um, and just to give uh, the, the group here today uh, a little teaser on some of the strands that were developed um, just some essential foundational teachings um, some preparation for meeting with the knowledge keeper um, how to ask um, you know, some knowledge keepers, there are different uh, protocols. And so that's also part of uh, the next step. There is an acknowledgement and protocol and knowing that there are uh, diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities uh, across Canada. And depending on where you're situated, there uh, will most likely be different protocols for different um, territories and different communities. So to be aware of that. And um, you'll have to uh, come to the website later when we have the uh, virtual booklet on there to get the rest of that information. So what's next for us is uh, rolling out existing resources and outreach. Um, continue identify additional learning gaps as we know they continue to uh, to, sh to show up. Um, also to develop and pilot the new materials and uh, also implementing and the spread of the learning pathway. So its focus is within the CanSol CKD network, but there is definitely um, opportunity for uptake from um, any other organizations to, uh, to uh, take the learning markers. So with that, I'll say miigwech. Thank you. Great, thank you, Greg. I really appreciate that. Uh... Um, and uh, much needed resources. Um, one thing that I'm learning is, is uh, so much about our partnerships and work that we can work with in our Indigenous communities is, is to learn from and, uh, and to really, you know, your, the knowledge and wisdom is, and how communication and is done in such a respectful manner is something we can all learn from. So I really appreciate that and look to uh, enjoy this resource myself and uh, promote it uh, widely. Um, so just a reminder for everyone, um, this session has been recorded. The chat box will be saved. Um, if there's specific questions that you want uh, to have and uh, be shared the responses back, please put your name in the chat box. Uh, we're happy to do that. And it's also just a reminder that these all these posters are still on the website. They will be there. They're accessible, and the access to the QR codes are there as well. So, uh, lots of ways to uh, engage and re-explore. This, this was a great opportunity, but uh, it's always nice to go back and revisit. So, again, I thank everyone for your participation in this poster session. It was incredibly engaging. I loved all of the presentations. We will be uh, reconvening again in another Zoom session. I think we're all getting a bit Zoom fatigued. <laughs> As a physiotherapist and a healthcare provider, I do really want to just make sure that uh, we all remember to stand up, move around, get some exercise, get some refreshment, get some food, uh, put this next panel presentation on the screen and uh, stand up and move around while you're, while you're watching it, because I'm sure we've all been sitting way too much today. So. Um, Thank you very much uh, again to everyone. If you have any quick questions, I'm going to be just keeping this uh, meeting live so I can capture any additional questions you want to add at the last minute. 
Otherwise, feel free to leave and uh, we'll see you again in the panel session that starts in about five minutes. So thank you everybody.